I'm Michael Penny. And at the CRE Midlands in, uh, in this last year, November, I actually had the privilege of giving a seminar on learning to love your enemies. Ah, that was interesting. It got some good questions. So let's go on to the next slide. So one of the questions that I was asked was, how can you learn to love someone? You don't learn to love someone. You either sort of fall in love with them, or you do love them, or you're brought up loving them, or something like that. Well, maybe we have the slightly wrong idea of what it means in the Bible to love. For instance, in Titus chapter 2, verse 4, uh, Paul had put Titus, a Gentile, in charge of the island of Crete. Now, he was the first Gentile leader, and he was put in charge of this very, very Gentile area. Lots of pagans on it. And some of these pagans were becoming Christians. And one piece of advice that Paul gave Titus was that the older women are to train the young women to love their husbands and to love their children. Now, how do you train somebody to love someone else? Um, you know, um, why is it necessary to tell these young women to train them to love their husbands? Um, the King James Version puts it that the older women are to teach the young women to be sober, to teach the young women to love their husbands, and to teach the young women to love their children. So how do you teach somebody to love? As I say, this, this may be something about love that we don't really understand. Now, putting us back into that historical time, as I said, a lot of these would have been pagans, pagan Gentiles, who had come to become Christians. Now, in the pagan world, relationships are really bad. You know, many of these women would have been in marriages which had been arranged, they didn't really like the man, and, oh, dear, oh, me. But now they become Christians. You know, in some parts of the world, like in Rome, where women were very, um, well, they chose their own husbands and things like that. It's said that uh, women change their husbands every year when they change their fashions. There was little love, as we think about it, between uh, husband and wife in those days. But what about the men? Let's have a look at the next slide, number three. Well, this is what Paul writes in Ephesians. Now, Ephesians was probably a circular letter, went to lots of different churches, not only the church at Ephesus, and um, as again, lots of pagan women had become Christians, and so had a lot of these Gentile pagan men. And of course, there they treated their women with disdain. They were quite often not younger. Uh, women were younger, wives were younger, and so the men looked superior over them and treated them, well, maybe a little bit better than a servant or a slave. So Paul emphasizes this in this incredible passage in Ephesians 5. Husbands, love your wives. How? Just as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. That's how you are to love your wives, totally unselfishly, sacrificially. He goes on later to say, husbands ought to love their wives as their own bodies. You love your own body, you take care of your own body, you feed it, you nurture it, do the same for your wife. And he finishes that section by saying, each one of you must love his wife as he loves himself. You love her as yourself. In the actual fact, you ought to love her more than yourself. Really, you ought to love her as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. So this really is a love of action. How did these women who were perhaps forced into marriage, arranged marriages, treat the man they've been given to? Well, you train them, you teach them how to love. Ah, slide for them. I think in some Christian circles we've forgotten two great action words, faith and love. We, we tend to think they have nothing to do with what we do. But in fact, they both are very important. They are action words. Faith. Okay, true faith is not simply something we intellectually acquiesce to. It should manifest itself in good works. And James and Paul are very clear on this. So if we have true faith in Jesus Christ, we should have the works which show it. 
Remember what James says in chapter 2 verses 14 and 18. What good is it, my brothers and sisters, if someone claims to have faith but has no deeds? Can such faith save them? Show me your faith without deeds and I will show you my faith by my deeds. So, you know, here's somebody is saying, I'm a Christian, but you see absolutely no good works. In fact, you see them carrying on in the lifestyle they had before they were Christians. Or, you know, they carry on as non-Christians do. So you question, are they really Christians? Oh yes, I have faith in Jesus. Have you really? Have you really? And near Paul states in Ephesians 2, 8 to 10, makes it very clear, for it is by grace you have been saved through faith. And this not from yourselves, it is the gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast. For we are created by God. We are God's handiwork. We've been created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. So faith should manifest itself in works. If it doesn't manifest itself in works, then we have every right to question, like James did, whether that is real faith and whether it is a faith that can save someone. But let's move on to slide five and look at love. <clears throat> it's the same with love. And the Lord made this very clear in John 14, 15. If you love me, keep my commands. Simple as that. If you love me, keep my commands. If you don't keep my commands, do you love me? Mm -hmm. And Jesus immediately went on to explain that his command was that they should love one another with the same self-sacrificing love he had shown them. He had shown them his love for them by his works. They were to show their love for each other by their works. A man was to show his love for his wife by how he treated her in the same self-sacrificing way that Christ loved the church. And of course, Paul's great definition of love in 1 Corinthians 13, 4 to 5, has nothing about emotion. We tend to think love is totally tied up with emotion, feelings. Well, look at what he says here. Love is patient, love is kind. It does not envy, it does not boast, it is not proud. Love does not dishonour others. It is not self-seeking, it is not easily angered, and it keeps no record of wrongs. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices in the truth. Love always protects. Love always trusts. Love always hopes. Love always perseveres. Love never fails. So this is this great word, love. Let's go on and see if we can define it a bit more in slide six. It's the great word agape. Agape love. A love of action. And in my book, uh, Love in the Bible, I, I, I give this definition, which is, is based upon one given by William Barclay. Agape, this is unconquerable benevolence, undefeatable goodwill. It is the spirit which will never seek anything but the other person's good, no matter what the other person does. It is the attitude which, no matter what the other person is like, and no matter how we may feel emotionally about him, we'll always seek the other person's good. Wow. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Wow. How many people do I love like that? That's the four. Well, mm. no matter how we may feel emotionally about him, we'll always seek the other person's good. Um, this word is so high and holy, Bishop Lightfoot says, it's hardly found in secular Greek. It's only in Biblical Greek or Christian Greek that you find this word. Yes, the, the Greek intelligentsia, the Greek writers knew about this word, but they, they knew it, well, it was too demanding, so they didn't use it much at all. So let's move on to slide 7. So we come now to loving your enemies. These are people that we should do good to no matter 
how we may feel emotionally towards them. Okay, so who are our enemies? Who's Jesus talking about in this incredible passage, Luke chapter 6, 27 to 28? Sylvia Penny has written this book called Loving Your Enemies. Um, you know, no exceptions at all. It, it, it goes into this subject in more detail than I, and it's well worth reading. Luke chapter 6, 27 to 28 says, But to you who are listening, he's, talk, he's talking to his disciples, I say, love your enemies. Do good to those who hate you. Bless those who curse you. And pray for those who mistreat you. So I suppose he's got three classes of enemies here. People who hate you, people who curse you, and people who mistreat you. Now, we are not likely to feel much warmth or emotional, good emotion towards such people. So how, how do we love such people? How do we love people who hate us? How do we love people who curse us? And how do we love people who mistreat us? Well, remember, this word is agape, and it's a love of actions. So what actions should we, should we show towards them? Slide 8 then says this. As I said, we're not likely to feel much warmth towards these people. So how do we love such enemies? It's by our actions. And so Christ tells us what we have to do. Right. Do a good turn to people who hate you. Okay, that's what you have to do. That's loving them. It's not feeling warm towards them. Not feeling cuddly towards them. You don't have to give them a hug. You, you know, you just have to do a good turn to people who hate you. If you have the opportunity, do something nice for them. And you never know. That may result in them no longer hating you. And you never know. <laughs> It may end up that the enemy becomes a friend. You may have to do two or three things, four things for that. But if somebody hates you, don't be vile towards them. Do something good. Okay, fair enough. Hard. Hmm. Yes, it is. No one ever said the Christian life was easy. The second group. Bless those who curse you. Now, bless you is the Greek word eulogia which gives us the word eulogize, speak well of. That's what it means. It means to speak well of somebody. So if somebody says something nasty about you, if somebody curses you, you don't retaliate in kind. Or, or you may be in gossip. You know, somebody comes up to you and you, they say to you, do you know what so-and-so said about you? They said, da, 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 da. Really? Well, our initial reaction it would probably be, go, oh, well, they're a fine one to say that. Do you know what they did? They did this, 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 this. No, that's not should be our reaction. If somebody in gossips comes up and says something that somebody has said about us, which is not very nice, then what we should do is say something like, oh, oh, that's unusual. He's a very nice chap or she's a very nice lady. I wonder why she said that. They're very good. Do you know what they did the other week? They did such and such, such and such, such and such. And you say something nice about them. So loving your this type of enemy, the ones that curse you, drag you down and say things about you which are not very nice, is to not retaliate, but do the exact opposite. Say something nice about them. That's what blessing them does. So, your number one may be emotional, hate. Number two may be verbal, what they say. Okay, and that's for those who may mistreat you in ways other than emotionally or verbally. Oh, what do you do? What do you really do if you don't? Can't do a good turn. Can't say something nice. Then you pray for them. You pray for them. That's what you do. And prayer alters the people who pray. It will change your attitude to them. And you never know. It may change their attitude to you. So let's go on to slide 9. Because in slide 9, Jesus now goes on to deal with more 
serious enemies. The ones we've just talked about are people who hate you, curse you, mistreat you, the other general ones we, we probably come across, maybe at work, maybe in our neighbourhood, uh, maybe in clubs we belong to, hopefully not in our churches, but it can happen. Anyway, these more serious enemies, he says this in Luke chapter 6, 29 to 30. If someone, if someone slaps you on one cheek, turn to them the other also. If someone takes your coat, do not withhold your shirt from them. Give to everyone who asks, and if anyone takes what belongs to you, do not demand it back. Wow. Well, <laughs> It may be hard to do um, what we said before, to bless those who curse us and to, uh, and to uh, do a good turn for those who hate us and to pray for those who mistreat us. But what are you going to do here? Yeah. Ah, I mean, I ask, is this loving them or is it self-preservation? Why do I say that? Why is it self-preservation? Well, in Matthew's account, he adds an interest in and perhaps a very significant detail. Let's have a look at it on slide 10. Matthew says this in Matthew 5.29 If anyone slaps you on the right cheek, turn to them the other cheek also. Turn the other cheek. Well, hang on a minute, it doesn't quite say that. It says if someone slaps you on the right cheek, turn to them the left cheek, the other cheek. Now, as the vast majority of people are right-handed, if you went to strike me, give me a good fist in my face, if you're right-handed, you will hit me on my left cheek. That's what you'll do. You'll hit me on the left cheek. So, if someone opposite me struck me in the face with his right fist, he would more than likely hit me on my left cheek. So the question is, could it be that the law that our Lord Jesus Christ was talking about a wham, a backhanded slap across the face, which was the usual way in which a more powerful senior dealt with somebody inferior? That backhanded slap. Maybe a Roman soldier, or a Roman officer, or maybe a temple official. Um, in Acts 23 uh, 2, um, there was a bit of an altercation uh, between Paul and the high priest and at this the high priest Ananus ordered those standing near Paul to strike him on the mouth. Wham! That's what they would do. So this is perhaps dealing with more serious enemies in the fact that you're dealing with people who are senior to you. Senior to you. How are we going to treat them? Let's go to slide 11. Well, if they're going to slap you on the left cheek with a backhanded slap, the, the reaction may be to cower. But he's saying, no, don't cower. Christ saying, don't cower, just turn the other cheek. Don't retaliate. Don't cower, just turn the other cheek. As Paul did in Acts chapter 23. He did apologise, but he didn't cower. Then he goes on to say, for example, if a Roman soldier asks for your coat and shirt, <laughs> just give it to him. Because <laughs> if, if you don't give it to him, he may well uh, take his sword out, and if he doesn't kill you, he may give you a good bang on it. Oh. You know. Oh. Give to everyone, i.e. an enemy more powerful than you, anything they want. No matter what this person in a senior position does. A backhanded sleep, a backhanded slap, Okay, turn the other cheek. If you want your coat, give it to him. If you want your shirt, give it to him. And as I ask, is the Lord talking about love here or is he talking about self-preservation? Um, I don't know. You can think about that yourselves. Um, yes, it is an act of selfishness, selflessness, and you never know if you just slowly take off your coat and give it to him. In a good manner, take off your shirt and give it to him in a good manner, you, you, you may carry some favour with the superior. Again, it, it's like, uh, you know, speaking well of those who curse you. 
doing a good turn to those who hate you. It's how do you, what's the reaction going to be in that person who is your enemy? But the interesting thing is we are told to love them by how we treat them, not, not how we feel emotionally towards them, by how we treat them, but are we ever told to forgive them? That's a very interesting question. We look at it at slide 12. Now, Matthew 18 is the great chapter on forgiveness. And again, Sylvia Penny's written a very good book on forgiveness, dealing with this in much greater detail than I'm going to deal with it. But you must pay attention to the detail. Matthew 18, 21, 22, then Peter came to Jesus and asked him, Lord, how many times shall I forgive my brother or sister who sins against me? Up to seven times? Jesus answered, I tell you, not seven times, but 77 times. Okay, wow. This, this is talking about fellow believers. It's not talking about your enemies. It's not talking about those who hate you, those who curse you, those who mistreat you. It's not talking about those who give you backhanded slaps or want to take your coat or your shirt. This is talking about my brothers, my sisters. And not just his literal brothers and sisters, but his spiritual ones. You've got to say, you know, how many times do Christians annoy Christians? <laughs> well, I, I certainly I know, I know some of my fellow Christians quite a lot, but they're very good, they forgive me. Uh, you know, what's wrong with you today? Did you get out of bed the wrong side? Sorry, sorry. Yep, okay. Okay, he's not talking about fellow believers. Let's go on to slide 13. But then Jesus goes on and talks about more serious sins between brothers and sisters in Christ. He says in Matthew 18, 15 to 17, if your brother or sister sins against you, go and point out their fault just between the two of you. If they listen to you, if they listen to you, You've won them over. Okay. All right. Somebody's done something a bit bad. Hurt you a bit. Dear old me. Okay. What do I do? I don't gossip about it. I don't go and say, oh, you know what sons of did to me. No. I go and see that person and try and sort it out. Ah. But he goes on to say, if they will not listen, take one or two others along, so that every matter may be established by the testimony or two or three witnesses. Okay, two or three witnesses. Hmm. Are these to witness what goes on between the two of you in, um, in this private discussion? If so, the other person ought to bring two or three witnesses along. Or is this two or three witnesses who saw what the other person did to you? That's interesting, isn't it? Hmm. Could be. Okay. All right. So, you did this to me, you did this to me in public perhaps, these people saw it, what was the problem? Can we sort this out? Well, hopefully it will be sorted out. But then the Christ goes on to say, if they still refuse to listen, tell it to the church. So, you know, let's take it to the whole church now, he says. Let, let, let's try and sort this out. Don't take it to the magistrates. Don't take it to the settled authorities. Try and sort it out in the church. And if they refuse to listen even to the church, treat them as you would a pagan or a tax collector, i.e. have nothing more to do with them. Now this is talking about fellow Christians. This is talking about fellow Christians. And I have to ask this question. What is the difference between the type of sins Peter spoke about how many times have I got to forgive my brother or sister? And Christ said 70 times 7. And the sins referred to you. The Lord doesn't, annoyingly, he doesn't say what type of sins it is. I mean, I wish he would. And as I ask again in Matthew 18, 15 to 17, these ones, is, it, is the Lord talking about something that's been done to a person in public? And so there are witnesses. I don't know the answer to that. But it, but it is a sad fact that the Lord has said that Christians sometimes should, because of they've been so badly treated by a fellow Christian, 
have nothing more to do with that person. Um, so, that's a statement. There are some fellow believers that sin so badly against us that we are right to have no more to do with them. Ah. I know one or two people have got to that point. You know, um, very sadly, but the relationship has broken down so badly that they have nothing more to do with each other. That's a shame. I'm not casting stones here, but the situation, I must admit, was pretty bad. And the other person wouldn't admit it and wouldn't apologise. Well, he wouldn't apologise because he didn't admit it. But it was obvious to others that he had done something pretty bad to the other person. Now, the question is, we are told to love our enemies, but we are not told to forgive them. <laughs> that surprises many people. And would it be right to have no more to do with that? If somebody treats you badly, slaps you across the face, a senior slaps you across the face, takes your coat, takes your garments, would you be right to avoid that person and have no more to do with them? You know, that, that's a hard question, isn't it? It tends to go across this ethic that goes around the place nowadays that Christians should love and forgive every single person. I'm not certain that's right, but what do you think? Nothing beats sitting on it, hearing it, tasting it, wearing it, handling it, trying it, comparing it. The copier produces a thousand copies for four pounds. The RISO digital printer produces a thousand copies for one pound twenty at 140 pages per minute. Discussing it. The interesting thing about this centre is it's a very difficult breed on a very small site. Buying it. Recommending it. I definitely recommend it. It's always good to have resources. And yeah, this is very resourceful, so it's a great place to be. Nothing beats being here. Buy your tickets online now. CREonline.co.uk forward slash tickets. <laughs>